Hello there and welcome back to video number 5 of Evolutionary Milestones. Everything until this point that we've looked at has been uh, a member of this group, the prokaryote, so archaea or bacteria. These are generally single celled and they, the cells have a structure that I described in video number 4, that kind of um, cell with a uh, single circular chromosome sitting in the cytoplasm. Uh, there's actually a third branch, however, to the tree of life. Those are organisms which have more complex cells. They're called the eukaryotes. So without further ado, let's learn about eukaryotes. And the uh, over the course of this video, we'll learn about both eukaryotes and some elements of their life cycles. So this group, the eukaryotes, includes fungi, plants and animals, but also a whole host of single-celled uh, organisms. Uh, including the amoebozoa and, for example, the algae. The cells of eukaryotes tend to be larger than those of prokaryotes. They're between 10 and 100 microns in size. Um, they possess organelles. These are membrane brown structures within the cytoplasm of the cell. You can see some examples on this slide here in uh, both animal and plant cells. Eukaryote cells generally have mitochondria, which we'll learn about in a bit, and things like, for example, plant cells have um, uh, chloroplasts in them, which allow them to photosynthesize. The uh, DNA in eukaryotes is held within a nucleus in linear chromosomes. Now, it's generally accepted that the archaea and the eukaryotes are more closely related to each other than they are to bacteria. Okay, so that's a statement of relationships there. How they have their origins, however, is a really interesting and different tale. We call the origin of the eukaryotes eukaryogenesis. So essentially, in its uh, most uh, basic form, this is the origin of the nucleus and protein synthesis uh, associated with that structure. And the origins of this um, system are very much a matter of active research. There have actually been massive strides uh, made since 2015 in understanding some elements of the origin of eukaryotes. But I should highlight that there is still a great deal of uncertainty around. We do know that this process resulted from a symbiotic association between an archaean, nowadays we even know which uh, particular subgroup of the archaea um, the host belonged to, which is a member of a thing called the Asgard clade, and a bacterium. The origin of the nucleus um, still has big error bars, so uh, I'm going to skip over that for this lecture because I'm afraid there just isn't time. But the far clearer picture exists for origins of some of the organelles, those membrane-bound structures which you find within eukaryote cells. And these structures occurred through endosymbiosis. This is the long-term mutually beneficial collaboration between prokaryotes. So you can see an example of a eukaryote cell on the left here with a load of these different organelles within it and the DNA held within the nucleus. Let's zoom in on just one of those organelles, the mitochondrion. So mitochondria are an example of an organelle. As you're breathing and when you're watching this video, within all of your cells, your mitochondria are the things that are processing oxygen for you and allowing that oxygen to be converted into energy to keep you alive. The origin of mitochondria is actually fairly well understood nowadays. This occurred when an oxygen-loving uh, bacterium, we even know what group of bacteria this belongs to, started a mutually beneficial relation relationship with an anaerobic archaean host cell. The cell protected the bacterium and the bacterium respired for the cell. At some point since this initial origin event, mitochondria lose their cell wall. They transfer some, but not all of their genetic material to their host. So mitochondria still have some of their own DNA. Indeed, in programs like uh, CSI, when people are talking about DNA analyses for crime, this is sometimes the mitochondrial DNA they're talking about. And they uh, provide 
energy efficient aerobic respiration that has allowed the eukaryotes to colonize new ecological niches. So through this beneficial relationship, both partners um, benefit and it's become a permanent thing. It's found, as I say, in the vast majority of eukaryotes. And there's a question about whether those eukaryotes that lack mitochondria um, lack them primarily, i.e. they never had them, or whether they lack them secondarily, i.e. they've actually just lost them again. The origin of eukaryotes had probably happened somewhere by 1,500 million years ago, exactly when, as with many of these things, remains a matter of debate. Most of the examples of early uh, eukaryotes that sample around this time close to their origins are taken from the 1,492 million year old Roper group of Northern Australia. So these are some really, really old fossils. In the top left is a um, fossil called Tapania. This is posited as a eukaryote because it's quite large in size. It has um, uh, preservable cell walls that have been recovered in this case through um, dissolving the host rock with acid and complex processes. So these are the things sticking out of those cell walls as well as possible budding structures which suggest possibly um, eukaryote-like life cycles. People have posited that this uh, organism was a member of the fungi. Panels C and E are examples of things that we think are probably prokaryotes, sorry, probably prokaryotes. I meant, of course, probably eukaryotes from the rope formation, but they're problematic. We just don't know what they are. There's no particular reason to think that everything that was alive um, at this time, all of the eukaryotes are related to living groups today. And so these could be examples of groups that have gone extinct. And in the bottom right is Gripania. This is a fossil that's known from China. It's about 1500 million years old and it's amongst the first macroscopic, so uh, visible with the naked eye, uh, fossils. It's unclear what it actually was, what it may have been more closely related to, but generally we agree that this was a eukaryote. So when can we really be sure that we have eukaryotes that are similar to living groups on Earth? Well, this happens by about 1.2 billion years ago. This is the earliest really clear evidence for eukaryotes that are similar to living groups. It's a fossil called Bangiomorpha pubescens. It's a filamentous microfossil um, of about 1.2 billion years old. Um, it's silicified, so preserved within silicon dioxide in uh, carbonates from Arctic Canada. And we can say based on its morphology and its reproductive biology and its life cycle that it is probably a form of red algae, a group that's still around today. If we're looking at the fossil record, um, there are various uh, fossil deposits after this point, and those allow us to say that at about 800 million years ago, uh, the fossil record suggests that there was an increase in the diversity of eukaryotes. A key feature in many eukaryote life cycles is sexual reproduction. This is especially true of macroscopic organisms. So these are animals, plants, fungi, for example. Now, you may never have thought about it, but actually sexual reproduction is kind of weird. It has a twofold cost to the organisms that use the system. Only half of the individuals can bear young and it requires the males to find the females. When they do find each other, they only pass on half of the ge their genetic material. An example of the real um, uh, consequences of this twofold cost is the anglerfish. I've put an image of one of these creatures here. They live in the deep, dark ocean. Have you ever seen the movie Finding Nemo? They feature for a short while in that movie. And these have a really interesting uh, life cycle because a male needs to find a female um, relatively quickly in the deep dark ocean and they're all the boys and the girls are quite far um, spread apart when the male does manage to find a female the male and the female fuse this is the girl and that tiny thing there is the boy 
The male becomes dependent on the female host for survival. It receives nutrients via a shared circulatory system and provides sperm to the female in return. So this is a really good example of a life cycle that's had to adapt to the costs of sexual reproduction within the deep ocean environment. Despite these costs, sexual reproduction is still really common in animals and plants and fungi and such um, complex multicellular organisms. Why may this be the case? There were a number of theories outlining the um, selective pressure towards sexual reproduction. And I'm going to introduce just one as part of this course. Please do feel free to ask me about some of the others in our Zoom session if you're interested in this. We still don't know for sure. It's probably a mix of all of these factors. But we know that sex outcompetes asexuality when there is a factor that kills a large proportion of a population. One that is sensitive to genetic variation and one that changes rapidly between generations. All of those things are true of parasites and of pathogens. These are nasty things that co-evolve with their hosts and they change rapidly. So I'm sure we're all acutely aware of the um, problems that pathogens cause because COVID-19 is one such pathogen. And as I've mentioned previously, it has RNA as its informational molecule, so it evolves fairly quickly. Sexual reproduction increases variation within population within populations and it speeds up the dispersion of novels, novel traits, possibly ones that, for example, could confer immunity to a disease. And so for this reason, we think that sexual reproduction may result from pathogens and um, par parasites. And this is an idea that's called the Red Queen hypothesis for the origin of sex. And this is taken from Alice in Wonderland, where she meets the Red Queen, who says that, my dear, we must run as fast as we can just to stay in place. And if you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as far as that. More generally speaking, the Red Queen hypothesis stresses inter-organism interactions and in evolution as opposed to environmental forcing. So I think that's really, really interesting, but I can't talk about it any longer, otherwise this video will get far too long. It's likely that sexual reproduction in the system dates back to the origin of the eukaryotes as a group. Once more though, the earliest incontrovertible evidence we have for sexual reproduction within eukaryotes in the fossil record goes back to Bangium morpha pubescens, which have, has a cellular structure suggestive of a sexual life cycle. 